issues that concern Africa. And by facilitating these dialogues and fostering these connections, we do our bit in contributing to the economic development and growth of our continent, Africa. I see a number of our individual and corporate members in the audience. And on behalf of our honorable chair, Arun Maote, who is joining us online today, I would like to thank you all for the amount of work, effort, and support on wavering commitment and generosity that you offer to us at Royal African Society. I also want to use this opportunity to invite others who are not members to join us in the work that we do and in promoting the work that we do and ensuring that we keep our mission alive and keep doing what we can as a society to advocate for Africa and most importantly, to promote and amplify Africa's voice globally. Before I finish up on this note, I just also want to thank our team who do remarkable work and they're all here with us today. And then I'm going to take a bit of time to introduce our, on, our wonderful chair of this event, Lord Hastings, who I will t spend one minute just to tell you a little bit about why we're very privileged to have you here with us um, today. So Lord Hastings is the chair of the SOAS Board of Trustees. He has a deeply purposeful career across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, working with education, philanthropy, justice, and business to support and develop communities around the world. He began his career as a teacher, then worked across various government agencies on policies that build racial equality. This includes as a commissioner with the Commission for Racial Equality, who he served for nine years. He's the chair of the London Chamber of Commerce and Industries Black Business Association and the chair of the advisory board of the Black Business Institute. And in 2003, Lord Hastings was conferred with a CBE, Commander of the British Empire, for services to crime reduction with peerage to House of Lords in 2005 as an independent baron. He is currently a vice president at UNICEF UK and a trustee for the Africa Philanthropy Foundation. We're very, very honored and privileged to have Lord Hastings with us today. And he's going to spend a little bit of time um, talking to you right now, after which we will be handing over to Nick Coughlin who is going to facilitate the conversation with our brilliant author, Mr. Aganga. We'll be followed with a Q&A, and at the end of this evening, I'm sure you're all looking forward to the wonderful African food and drinks, and most importantly, the networking and connections that we are very good at fostering at Royal African Society. Welcome again to every one of you, and thank you very much for being with us today. Well, let me add my welcome to SOAS on behalf of myself as chairman, but also the Royal Africa Society. Uh, welcome to my, I suppose, my third home. Parliament is my second home. My other home is somewhere out near Watford, but welcome to my home here and this incredibly important conversation we're going to have this evening. Uh, I have only one apology, which is that my older son, who's 28, is publishing his own book tonight by Penguin, and I have to make a speech there. So I will be handing to Nick shortly as I dash off to do honor to my son to make sure that he is also respected this evening. Thinking about Africa, and all of you who've come, as I look around the room, I imagine have a heartbeat for your country, for the continent, for its prospects, for what we believe. You may be wondering what my own heritage is. I often get asked the question. People are so curious to pin you down to a location, then they can make a judgment about you. Well, my father was born in Luanda, 
in Angola. And so I like to claim my West African, South West African heritage as fundamental to my own life. My mother was half Ghanaian, the other half was Panamanian. Uh, my father became a dental surgeon trained in the UK, then practiced in Jamaica, but his father was practicing as a, med uh, as a medical doctor in Luanda. My mother was a nurse, but she never ever practiced. Both are long gone. Yesterday, I was in Nairobi, in Kenya. Uh, I'm a governor of the Mpesa Safaricom Academy in Nairobi. We have 700 of Kenya's poorest and most needy children who we provide free education and a boarding experience. And I'm a non-executive director of a Kenyan company operating in nine countries on the continent and one country in Europe. So I think I have a fairly good grasp of the understanding issues, and we deal with them here at SOAS constantly. And I'm an optimist, as all of you must be optimists as you think about the continent. And this book, which I will relish in reading, I've only had my copy this evening, but Ola Sogan Aganga gave me it and has written a beautiful note in it, Jewel of Africa. So let me tell you the good news. A hundred years ago, a man called Bob Miner produced a fascinating cartoon. The cartoon had three big figures on it and three small figures. The small figures were the United States, Great Britain, and France. The three big figures, and there is the, those of you with very good eyes. <laughs> you can see the three big figures. The three big figures are China, India, and Africa. This was 100 years ago. Now, this is what he wrote next to his cartoon. Western nations rule the world because they were rich in money and guns. China, India, and Africa were poor in money and guns, but rich in people. One day, the balance of power will shift. Miner drew this cartoon in 1925. Now, 98 years later, the people of the world, says the commentary, are waking up and realizing something has changed. If you're an Afro-pessimist, you'll say, well, Africa is way behind India and China. That is true now. If you were to look at the latest world GDP figures, you'll see that the collective economic strength of the continent of Africa is smaller than the United Kingdom. All 54 countries represent only two-thirds the economic value of the UK today. However, Goldman Sachs just produced their 2075 projection. In fact, they produced it on Monday. And in their 2075 projection, they list China as number one, India as number two, the United States as number three, Indonesia number four, and Nigeria number five, with a projected 13.1 trillion dollars in GDP by 20. 75. Well, interestingly, as you go down the list of the strongest countries, some of the usuals are still in there. Of course, the United Kingdom is still there at number 11. Japan is there at number 12. But above the United Kingdom and Japan is Egypt, which I remind you is an African country, at 10.4 trillion. And also, Ethiopia further slightly down the list at 6.2 trillion. Let me do the maths for you. So Nigeria at number five, Egypt at number seven, Ethiopia at number 17. Add up the collective projected GDP of these three African countries, you get 29.7 trillion. 29.7 trillion is larger than putting all the European countries together. Now, that's fascinating. Just three African countries could, if they become ship shape and focused and swallow the medicine in this phenomenal book, could become, could become the third of the big figures of the future. Do you believe it's possible? 
If you believe it's possible, then you and I have to work to enable the outcome. Every time I was, I've been in Kenya twice this year already. I was there just a month ago for presidential business. But every time I go to Kenya, where I have a particular series of interests as a governor of the academy, as, uh, as also heavily involved in the Mpesa financial services product, and of course working with Safaricom and my non-exec responsibilities, every time I go to Kenya, I witness the fast tracking of a country that once was on the margins between Nigeria and South Africa, but this week Goldman Sachs says it is the third pearl in the great necklace of possibilities, and they place Kenya as equivalent in potential to Nigeria and South Africa. And I can tell you, go to Nairobi and love the road network, the highways, the airport, the clarity and the certainty. Watch what is possible in a short space of time, partnerships, yes, fundamental. But can it be done? Yes, it can. Is it possible to have booming, effective business and sound politics? Yes, it is. Is it a perfect place? No, not yet. It's not Botswana, which is pretty idyllic. Rwanda is well-placed, but there are challenges around governmental structures, but economically and socially, well-placed. But thankfully, Kenya, and to a certain extent, Ghana, although its economy is now in trouble, represent the prospects of a greater stability in the continent. So when you get the time to study this book, to listen to Olusegun himself when he speaks, to hear his answers and to reflect on the possibility, what sits on you and me is the duty of action. I was having a discussion with our 18-year-olds as they're leaving the M-Pesa Academy on Monday afternoon. They're heading off into universities in Kenya, but also across the continent and around the world. We were proud to note, and they were very proud to note, that Kenya was the first country in the world, not on the continent, in the world, to ban the use of single plastic bags. Now we've done the same. But we followed an African lead. But most people think it was down to Sainsbury's and Tesco's. And Morrison's, no, it wasn't. It was down to the Kenyans. And an 18-year-old Malawian is the first young African to come up with the practical solution of how to turn moving energy in roadways into deliverable electricity to run households. Is there innovation that is smart and effective? In PACER itself, Two-thirds of a trillion dollars passes through our M-Pesa system every day. Is it possible to change this continent for the greatness that lies beyond? India has done it. China has done it. Whatever you make of the politics, if you've been, and I've been multiple times, appreciate the place. Be glad of the freedom people have for good health care. The end of extreme poverty the quality of water that they receive, the education that is not only freely available, but is of excellence, matching universities to the United States and even here to the United Kingdom. We have much to learn from the countries that we once thought were destitute and the continent that, when the jewel of Africa is read, observed and followed, will be the next in line. I wish you a great evening. Nick, over to you. I'll do duty by my son. Well, thank you, Lord Hastings, very much indeed. That was a truly inspiring and uh, an exciting uh, speech, a really elevating um, a, a speech that gives us the prospects and the future uh, uh, here and now uh, from someone whose experience is so hands-on, so visionary, uh, and uh, so influential in many places, as we've just heard. Um, just a few words about myself. I cannot claim uh, any uh, connection uh, to Africa, uh, to Nigeria. Um, however, uh, as a journalist and writer about economics, uh, about banking, about finance, uh, I have made many uh, visits to Nigeria, uh, to West Africa, to South Africa, uh, and uh, write for different newspapers in the UK and globally. 
um, and have witnessed to some extent the uh, expansion of Nigerian banking, the quality of uh, Nigerian banking, uh, the excitement uh, as the country uh, embraces new technologies uh, and opportunities. So um, I uh, have been graced with the uh, invitation to talk to uh, Oli Shegung, um, whom uh, I will talk to uh, after I've given a, a short overview of his excellent, exciting book that uh, Lord Hastings has already referred to. Um, so if you'll bear with me, I'm, I've written something down, as we authors uh, do tend to do, um, uh, and excuse me if it's a little long-winded, which uh, probably I should have had an editor, but here we go. Um, uh, but anyway, this is really to introduce the book that we're launching today um, and that you will have an opportunity now to read. And as Oli Shogun so importantly says, uh, this is a roadmap. This is not uh, the, the, the answer. This is the way to the answer. But nevertheless... Um, Ole Shegun has produced a study of Nigerian politics and economics that's comprehensible and comprehensive, that's readable and is imbibed with humanity and values. And the word values is something he'll talk about uh, and something I will talk about more. Um, Mr. Oganga has a rare combination of inside knowledge of the country's political machine um, you'll know that he was a former finance minister of Nigeria and the minister of uh, industry, trade and investment. Uh, he's also uh, got the independence and the fearlessness of a leader that's been heavily influenced by his core values. It's that word again, values. Uh, this is not just an analysis of the problems facing Nigeria, but it contains a large number of practical solutions not just theory, but practice. And that's needed to address the issues that he identifies. Importantly, he also draws from the experience of other countries, which is interesting, uh, Singapore, uh, Scandinavia, um, and elsewhere. For all these reasons, uh, Mr. Ganga's book is an essential reading for anyone who wants to understand Africa's largest and possibly most complex country. Now we begin in the book by talking about leadership and governance, two key themes of both the book and of everyone's thinking about Nigeria. And here um, he laments to some extent Nigeria's problem in growing enough leaders, leaders who understand values, who have the competence and who have the vision that the state requires to build that future that Lord Hastings has described. Uh, this is exacerbated, this lack of leadership, by the inability of the political system and institution to attract the best and most competent people into politics. Of course, there are plenty of competent people, but there could be more. The book also talks about how, how money tribe, religion, and poverty influence political outcomes and elections in Nigeria and other developing countries. A word on Shegung himself. He's both a technocrat and a meritocrat. He believes people should get there who deserve to get there. He's a man who wants the machinery of government to work and who understands that it takes the most able to be there for the good of the country. And he hopes the younger generation will pick up the baton and take Nigeria out of its difficulties to the promised highlands that Lord Hastings has referred. Now, whether Shegun is talking about institutions, economy, the church, the society, or the educational system, he emphasizes humane values, service to the country. Now, that's something terribly important to, to Shekung, service, accountability, and transparency. And there's nothing he worries about more, more deeply, than the levels of waste 
and leakage and corruption and self-interest at the expense of the national interest. Now, of course, corruption, as we all know, is not peculiar to Nigeria or to Africa, but it is a problem. Now, we move in the journey Shagun takes us on from leadership and governance to the quality of the economy, of the society, of the political institutions, which determine whether nations fail or succeed. Mr. Aganga questions the fitness for purpose of Nigeria's presidential and political systems. Can the country afford these systems? And are they producing the best results for Nigerians, he asks. And we'll have a chance to talk to him about that later. I'm fascinated in particular by Shegun's account of his early family life, of his devoted parents, and of the structure of the family. As well as being instructive, it's also moving. The family for Shegun is an institution that he respects and praises. He brings his own experience into the analysis of Nigeria's civil service, which he describes as the backbone of any government. But once again, meritocracy and the human factor are uppermost in his thoughts. He, he asks, if civil servants could be trained better, if they could be paid better, then wouldn't we attract the best people? He suggests departments could be organized more efficiently. And he insists that recruitment and promotion should be based on merit. Now, when we talk about Mr. Aganga's strongest card, you'll know that he worked for Goldman Sachs for many years. So he writes with great confidence and vision about issues like the management of Nigeria's debt, its exchange rate management, and so on. These are all meat and drink to, the, to, a, to our man. <laughs> we recall that he created the country's sovereign wealth fund, which is, is today a lead investor. We can only hope that Nigeria's financial managers read this book and learn and apply the lessons. This section on economy flows very comfortably into a section on investment, and he draw, draws here on his experience as a key contributor to Nigeria's effort to become the number one investment destination in Africa. He concludes his book by looking at the country's greatest and least utilized resource, its people. He analyzes appropriate responses to the triple scourges of poverty, of unemployment, of insecurity and he advocates a new and effective value system. It's that word again, values. He wants, he envisages a law and order society, education and skills that are relevant to the country. Despite the challenges, Shegun has a firm conviction that Nigeria and Africa have all that is required to be prosperous. He believes Nigeria will be an unstoppable force and among the world's most successful countries, once uh, his, uh, his book and his recommendations have been uh, understood and implemented. And he draws attention to one key element in this onward march, and that is Nigeria's diaspora. And it's a, already a major contributor to the country's prosperity. So, to sum up, We've got here an important analysis run through with humane values, seriousness of purpose and vision. So I ask you all to read Shegun's book and hope that in due course it will unleash the potential of this shining jewel for all its citizens and for the continent of Africa. Thank you very much. And now, and now for the man himself, uh, Shegun. Um, Thank you very much for your book, and we can now hear your, your words. Oi. 
Well, Shagan, thank you very much for uh, uh, your wonderful book, and thank you very much for sharing with us your thoughts and visions today. Um, I mentioned um, uh, that this book is your roadmap. Could you perhaps tell us, first of all, why did you write the book, and what are you hoping it to achieve with it? Well, thank you very much, Nick. Um, by the way, that was Nick's account, not my account. And I didn't pay him anything for doing that. But I have read about four different reviews, and they all say different things about the book. But that's what's interesting about books and all that. Um, now, to your question. Um, there are so many reasons why I wrote the book. But let me talk about what I consider to be the most important one. My, the, I think my mindset when I wrote the book was exactly the mindset Lord Hastings has. It's not, I was not lamenting about my country, Nigeria. I'm a proud Nigerian. And I know that, I know where Nigeria is today. I was writing the book from a framework from a mindset of having a vision of where Nigeria could be, as he said, but knowing that they have, we've had so much about the potential of Africa and Nigeria. And uh, when I went into government, I had the privilege of being a finance minister, chairman of economic management team, and later minister of industry trade and investment. That gave me the opportunity to see Nigeria. And I saw that it was, when they talk about the potential, this is a huge, great potential. There's no doubt that Nigeria would be can be one of the prosperous nations in the world. I could see when you have a country that has more than 48 solid minerals in commercial quantity, more than 84 million hectares of land, million hectares of land where almost everything can grow, is a top 10, top 15 gas producer and oil producer has a demography, which is the envy of the world, average age of about 18 years, and has a very strong diaspora community out there. Not many, many, not many countries can boast of having all that in terms of human and natural resources. So the question is, how do we get to that land? How do we reclaim that jewel? Because we were once a great nation. And I looked around, most books, if you ask people about what's wrong with Nigeria, do we fix it? Most people tell, some of you tell, it's, it's about leadership. Others will say it's about corruption. My answer is that it's not as simple as that. We need something that is comprehensive, which is why former president of South Africa described this book as a roadmap. We need something to come. It's not just about corruption. It's not just about leadership. We need to look at also this. There was nothing there that is comprehensive enough, and the idea was to write something that is comprehensive. They said, "This is these are the things we need to do to get to that promised land." So it's a vision which I am excited about, which I think most Nigerians should be excited about, Africans should be excited about, and it's about how do we get to that vision, that that promised land. Um, when I Submitted this, the transcript, I think it was about 145,000 words. And uh, my publisher said, well, that's enough for three books. <laughs> you know, or, 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 do you want to publish three volumes? And I said, no, 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 I just want to, a book. We had to cut it down for 145,000 words. An average book is about 55,000 words. We, we got down to 85,000 words. It was an emotional thing to do because we had invested heavily in writing what we, we wrote before. So the whole idea is we have a great opportunity to be one of the greatest countries in the world. We are all stakeholders. We need to play a role in achieving that vision, in reclaiming that jewel, and this is what we need to do. So I'm hoping that together, the policymakers and all of us will read this and play there's a role for the private sector, there's a role for the policymakers, a role for people in public, uh, uh, in the public sector, and all that. So I am hoping that this is the beginning, it's a call to action, put it that way, 
the beginning of our journey to that destination. Thank you, Shankar. Well, that's uh, in, indeed a most uh, uh, optimistic and uh, an interesting perspective. Realistic optimism. Right. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Not, not, a, not, not a dream. Not a dream. I have seen it. It's doable. Yes. And I think in your book, uh, if I may, uh, you have uh, several hundred rec specific recommendations, if, if memory serves me. Yes. Uh, well, the, the, I, a consultant who went through the book wrote, came up with about 35 key recommendations and about 147 specific recommendations. The, what I was trying to do, I, again, most books talk about problems, not the solutions. I wanted to focus more on the solutions, but not just the symptoms, but the causes of the problems. So when you talk about, maybe you talk about corruption, why, what are the causes of that? And that's what we need to focus on if we want sustained solution to these issues. Now, I have plucked a quote from the book which I thought you might want to comment on. Um, it's uh, by Nelson uh, Mandela. And he said, uh, obviously, uh, in another context at another time, but he said, the world will not respect Africa until Nigeria earns that respect. The black people of the world need Nigeria to be great as a source of pride and confidence. Now, that seems to me to really put the burden on Nigeria to say, here is a model that Africa can follow, observe, and apply. It's a huge burden on Nigeria. It's a huge opportunity for Africa. Um, it is a burden, but a burden which Nigeria can actually deal with. You see, when I was in government, I went to at least 68 different countries marketing the country. And I went to many African countries, including Botswana, Rwanda, Kenya, and all those countries. Everywhere I went, my experience was that they all want Nigeria to succeed because they know. So Madiba was echoing what you hear and what you see. And the reasons are very obvious. You obviously know that Nigeria has, is the number one economy in, in Africa. One out of every five African you see is a Nigerian. If you look at the population, a billion plus, 200 million plus. If, and that is replicated in the diaspora. And when you look at the diaspora, I think if you look at the immigrant population in the United States, Nigeria is supposed to have the most highly educated uh, immigrants in America, for example. I remember when we visited uh, President Obama at the, uh, the White House. The first thing he told the president and the team that went there, is, look, there are more than 25,000 Nigerians in the US supporting the health system. We have them, the same thing here. So when you look at, and Nigeria has played a role in Africa, we played a very, very important role in the time of apartheid. Uh, we played a very important role, peace missions all over Africa. We, we, uh, so I, I think it's obvious that for Africa to be great, Nigeria has to rise. And it's in, and in an interest. So the idea was looking at Africa from the eyes of Nigeria. Because if we reclaim the jewel, Africa will be great. It becomes a model for the African countries. May I now turn from the very large picture to your own um, family and background, uh, Shegun? Um, the impact of your family and your uh, background on your thinking, on your analysis, and I know that for you, family is terribly important, and I thought you might like to read just a short passage from page 45 of the book, where I think you talk about some of your uh, family members. Right, okay. Now, again, to be honest, when I started writing, it wasn't my, I'm a very private person. Um, it wasn't my intention to write about my family. I was in, to put this in the context, I was, I was writing about institutions, that when institutions are weak, nations fail. Um, and there are three major institutions, political institutions, economic institutions, and social institutions. The social institutions people undermine, but actually it's the most important. That's where you have health, 
education and family. And I had to talk about my family to explain what I meant about the importance of the family institution within the social institution in terms of nation building. That is the context. So I said, the family is also a critical, a critical part of a nation's social institution. The family's primary role is to nourish its members, protect them, educate them, and provide a stable social status. I am what I am today, and I say this quite often, I am what I am today because of the upbringing I had at home and the school I attended. The environment in which individuals grow, learn, and socialize is essential precisely because it has been shown to affect their prospects later in life. My parents instilled two things in my, my siblings and I when we were growing up. And they repeated regular and they repeated this regularly. They told us that they were training us and investing heavily in our education to ensure that we could speak and be heard by our peers anywhere in the world. The second point they regularly made borders on financial independence. They reminded us that they were giving us the necessary tools required through education to be self-sufficient so that when we give to each other as siblings, it is born out of love, not out of necessities. Birthday letters were a constant feature of my childhood and adulthood. The letters my mother wrote to us on our birthdays were long, about 15 pages, unfailingly. Every birthday, The, the, the carefully constructed and well articulated letters for our birthday were our unique gifts from her, not bicycle, not books. Not, the an, iPad, not an iPad. Not an iPad or an, or an iPhone. The letters were warm and maternal, but they were also a lens through which she could assess our lives during the past year, as observed by my mother. She praised us for what we did well and pointed out areas where we needed to improve on. At an early age, she insisted I listen to the news with her from the radio and we would discuss what we heard after the news. Then she would give me three daily newspapers for that day asked me to read the same story or news item in the papers and then tell her which writing or reporting I preferred and why. We were taught that contentment is the biggest wealth any one of us could have. Now, it, academic excellence was taken for granted, but it was important to our parents that we also excelled in sports and extracurricular activities. For example, every child had to join the Boy Scout or Girl Scout or Boys Brigade or Red Cross. My mother was a proud member and officer of Girl Scouts and Red Cross. And then I went on and on to talk about um, how we got, even when I was going to secondary school, uh, she had done all the research of her school and she, my mother insisted that we, I went to a school that delivered three things, academic excellence, spiritual insight, and character formation. And I'm happy today that I went to, the, to that school. It's called Christ School at So, so it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just to let you know how parents, the family background has a major role in nation building. I will always say I am what I am today because of the parental uh, guidance I had, my upbringing, and the school I went to. I, I'll be honest, I find that a very uh, humbling and uh, inspiring uh, 
um, uh, vision and uh, uh, analysis, um, because uh, I mean, an awful lot of people would not have been blessed with a mother like yours. Um, and uh, even I'm, I'm, I imagine at times perhaps she was quite strict, but um, it was a, an important uh, uh, catalyst. No, no, you were not too old to be disciplined. <laughs> Everyone, no matter how old you were. My mother would discipline you. But he told me to read the area of my, my father also played a role. So parents played a role. But she, those 15, 20 pages later, were hers. Every one of us got that letter on or about her birthday. And you would sit down and discuss it with her. <laughs> well, I'm going to turn now to somebody very, very different um, whom you have also... Um, 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 what should we say, worked with and uh, worked for and, uh, and, and, and been appreciated uh, by, and that is the former president, Good Luck Jonathan. Uh, not uh, perhaps uh, of the same eminence as your mother, but um, <laughs> you, 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 had, you had a remarkable uh, career with him and appreciation of him. Uh, you've written a little bit about it in your book, and I wonder if I may uh, ask you to uh, just share with that with us a little bit of that, uh, one particular experience that... Um, right. That what I was, again, to put into perspective, I was not writing about President Jonathan. I was writing about... I think the, the, the heading there is that values are sacred. I am saying that those who lead us, leaders, all of us, everyone in this room is a leader. I am saying that the values, the way we live our life, if we're values-based leaders, we're likely to be far more successful in what we do, and it will influence all those people around us. That, that was the context in which I, I was talking about the president. And what I said here, I said, as Minister of Finance, I met with the president fairly regularly to iron out matters of state as they pertain to fiscal and other measures. Some of the meetings unavoidably ran late into the evenings or the early hours of the next day. There was never enough money to do all we wanted to do as a government. And this meant prioritizing. On one particular occasion, the meeting took much longer than anticipated, and at, at about 1 a.m., the president asked me to excuse him so that he could catch some sleep. I was to come back at 8 a.m., as he had some files to look at for matters coming up later that day. When I went back at 8 a.m. the following day, the president was at his home office, but still in his clothes from the day before, and explained that he had not slept because there were some pressing matters which came up after I left him at 1 a.m. He then asked me to come back later in the evening in order to conclude our prior meeting. It was just one example of how the office of the president imposes demands on the occupier of that office. It is extraordinarily taxing and unpredictable. When the leadership of the country takes diligence as a core value, however, it sets the term for the whole country. That was the point I was just trying to... Like the lead, when you have a leader who says diligence that's hardworking, um, strives for excellence, it affects the team around him and it affects the outcome of that administration. That was the point I was trying to, to get across, to say the president is not, we well, see the president all the time reading speeches, but actually it's not an easy job. It's a tackling, it requires some, a very hardworking person uh, to make it work. And I think you, you do believe that President uh, Goodluck uh, Jonathan's reputation is not fair in, in, the, in the scheme, in the history of books, if you like. 
Um, I didn't write that. I think you, 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 you are inferring that. But you are not to, you are not wrong in terms of inference. I, I just want to make sure that people know what's there. What it is. You're not too wrong at all. I agree with you. Um, we won't I, I find said, anything in the book to uh, no, no, no. confirm that. No, because this book was written. Um, one thing I made clear right from the beginning is that it's not about any individual or uh, it's to cast as passion against anybody. It's about a vision of where we could be and how we could get there, and how we can get there and what we need to do. And I tried as much as possible not to cast any expression. Or it's not about, about any government or any individual. Uh, but where it is necessary to bring in people, I, I will bring them in. Now, I think people have, they, you look at the president from afar, and there's so many stories said about them, and people believe them and they say them. I don't think anyone who worked closely with President Jonathan would, would say that they would see him as a very, very, I find it very easy working for him because all I could do, all I needed to do to get what I wanted done was just to appeal to his reasoning. And all through my time in government, it was clear to me he was only interested in what is best for the country. There was no political agenda. So it was so easy for me to get whatever. You just appeal to his reasoning. Here is a president who all the memos that come to council every Wednesday, he would have read everything. He, where he needed expert opinion, he would invite you. And this is a person who was a local government chairman, a vice uh, deputy governor, a governor, a vice president, and a president. So he has a very clear understanding about how governments work at the local government level, state level, and federal level. Very, very knowledgeable. The difference, I think, why people misunderstand his style of leadership, apart from being a very, very good human being, is that he leads from the middle. People are used to seeing a leader lead from the front, but that is incorrect. Leaders can lead and can be effective. They can lead from the front, from the middle, or from the back. President Mandela, when he was president, ruled from the back. Jonathan rules, leads from the middle. President Obasanjo leads from the front. Different, there are different styles of leadership. No, he just, but he leads from the middle. And because of that, some people may perceive that to be a little bit weak, but that's a different leadership style. What is important is the team you have around you. If you have the right team around you, it, you work harmoniously when you lead from the middle. There are occasions when you have to lead from the front. There are occasions when you have to change your leadership style and lead from the back. There are different ways of leading. Very but I think he was always in the, in the middle. He led me, mainly from the middle. I wanted to actually, related to that, was come to the, something I mentioned in, in earlier, was the, for you, uh, and for the country, the importance of meritocracy, of getting the right people in the right jobs, in the right ministries, and in the right sort of time of life, if you like. And, you know, it, it's very easy for, in some countries, some places, the wrong people to be in the right jobs and the right people in the wrong, and then the country suffers. And you, I think, believe this is something Nigeria needs to look to. Yes, and I, and I think everyone in this room will agree that for you to succeed, you have to have your best people playing for you. It's just normal. I, I don't think that's rocket science. I think everybody knows that. I think the question is, does that happen? And that's why I think we talk a lot about values. Is it every history has shown that the most successful countries in the world and the most successful companies in the world are built on core values. Core, the foundation is, 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 is the value, it's built on that. That's, that's, that's. At Goldman Sachs, we have, when I was there, we have uh, 14 business principles that guide exactly what we do. It's impossible for you to become a managing director at Goldman Sachs 
if you are not a culture carrier. There were three things we looked for. Leadership, commercial awareness, but you must be a culture carrier. You must understand what it is. You hear about the British values, the American values, what is Nigerian values? So when you have those values of integrity, compassion, excellence, all those things, patriotism and all that, I think it, it which cuts across all the things we do, there's no doubt that you will, meritocracy becomes important. You, you will affect it, put it that way. And I think for us to get the best, uh, we must do that. Uh, I recall when I first went into government, when I went into the Minister of Finance, um, I was pleasantly surprised with the people I met there. They were actually very, very good, better than I ever expected. I later realized that some ministries are, uh, are classified as professional ministries, which means that they go on training and they're there for a long time or uh, well, whatever it is. Uh, yeah. Trade and investment wasn't. But the best officers I worked with were for me, foreign affairs. They were excellent. Whether you're dealing with them in Nigeria or dealing with them outside Nigeria, they were fantastic. It was a joy, a privilege to work with foreign affairs officers. When I spoke to my, 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 my counterpart, um, late uh, Ben Gashiro, who was a minister then, he told me, oh, this is a dying breed. And I said, oh, dying breed, why? He said, well, a lot of things have changed. In those days, they recruited the best people from the universities. They invested heavily in their training. You had to learn a second language within two years of being in foreign affairs. You were attached to different uh, foreign embassies. It was, and they were the best we could have. But somewhere along the line, we have put that to one side. And the idea is that we need to do that again. Recruitment, promotions, and all that have to be based on merit. Yes, we need federal, uh, uh, federal character. We need to balance that. But we need to, both of them working together. Now, I wanted to come to something that I think is one of your greatest achievements in, uh, in, uh, in your tenure as finance minister and the creation of the Sovereign Wealth Fund, which um, was a, uh, groundbreaking in Nigeria. It came with its challenges, um, but it put Nigeria up there with the best in the world uh, and also it promised for Nigeria an investment um, uh, um, opportunity uh, that uh, hadn't been there before. Would you like to tell us a little bit about how that happened, uh, Shegun, and, uh, and, and what it did for the country? Well, I've been told that we have five minutes. Ah. <laughs> it's and a long story. Yeah, story. and that's a very long story. That's why it's a, it's a very long story. So right. it's very difficult to do that, but I, I'll just give you a quick, quick snapshot there. Um, there were a number of reasons why we, we had to do that. Um, we were reliant on one um, commodity, meaning that... 90% of our foreign income came from oil. Uh, more than 75, 80% of our, the total income came from same oils. So we, the economy was not diversified enough. And this is a finite asset. Um, and yet we don't have control on the oil price. So what most countries, OPEC countries, commodity dependent countries do is that they set up, they use the money, they use the they set up sovereign wealth fund to diversify the economy. And of course, to cushion the shock, the external shock when you have price fluctuations, uh, and you use that uh, generational uh, equity to uh, savings and stabilization, um, and use it for development. Um, of, of all the countries, at the time I, I went for this, there were only three countries that were members of OPEC or dependent on commodities that did not have sovereign wealth fund, Iraq, Nigeria, and Ecuador. So this is something we should have done a very, very long time ago. Um, so it was important we did it. It was difficult to do because, of course, some state governors said, why do we need to save? It's already flooded in my state. You know, why do we need to? You don't need a sovereign wealth fund. There were, it wasn't easy, yeah, but we got there. And we, we came up, luckily, after two years, and, and we set it based on what we call the Santiago principles. I wanted the best for Nigeria, mm -hmm. something that the world would see and say, yes, this. So 
we set it very carefully to make sure that it complied with all the Santiago principles in terms of accountability, uh, transparency, and, and within two years of its operation, it got an award um, as one of the best uh, in the world. Uh, I'm delighted that the, the first CEO of the Soaring Wealth Fund is here, Uchi, Uchi Oji, he's there. Um, I'm very pleased that we had this opportunity to hear Shagun talk about this because uh, uh, it is so close to your heart. Uh. So look, I mean, time has chased up and we hadn't even realized what was happening. Um, you, I think we were, you were hoping to read the last paragraph of the book and uh, it's a fitting way to end on an optimistic high note uh, that all our discussion uh, will lead to. Uh, okay. All right, the last paragraph says, from the outside before I left Goldman Sachs in London to serve in government, I felt like everyone else that Nigeria and Africa had great potential. When I got in and served first as Minister of Finance and Chairman of the Economic Management Team, and later as Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, I moved from feel, feeling to seeing. I saw that Nigeria did in fact have all it takes to be a great nation, and that there is a bright light at the end of the tunnel Six years after leaving government, I have moved from feeling and from seeing to knowing that the future of Nigeria is indeed very bright, despite the current challenges. And I do not take these challenges lightly. The younger generation gives me hope and inspiration that when, not if, the matters in this book are fully addressed, there will be no stopping Nigeria and Africa. Patrice Lumumba must have seen this when he said, the day Nigeria wakes up, Africa will never be the same again. Nigeria will rise again. And that green passport would be our biggest asset. Ladies and gentlemen, we can now uh, have some questions. Um, we've heard an extraordinary manifesto, an extraordinary tale of, of an individual with great That sounds charisma. like a, a politician. You're calling me a politician? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were a politician. <laughs> no, I wasn't a politician. I was a technocrat in government. <laughs> I'd love to be, but... Uh, um, can we... Have the first question, please. And there's a lady here. Uh, sorry, I can't see. I, Aisha, well. Aisha, please make sure it's a simple one I can answer. <laughs> I better put my glasses on. <laughs> my other glasses. Oh, good evening. Congratulations. Um, so, yeah, my name is Aisha Umar, and uh, my question has to do with the issue of. Um, the external forces that also shape a nation's prosperity. Um, how much external influence or effects on, uh, is Nigeria facing vis-a-vis -vis its development? Because there's a big debate about if it's all our fault or if there are some external forces trying to prevent Nigeria from rising because they want us to remain where we are. Okay. Thank you. Take one or two more. Shall we take a couple more before um, Shagun answers? Um, uh, is there a gentleman there who wants... Uh, yeah, you're holding your hand up. Could, yes. With your y yellow... Sh yeah. Can someone give that gentleman a mic? Yeah. Well, <coughs> my question is about the political situation in Nigeria. How do we get out of the political agreement? You must say politics in Nigeria is a profession. It's not done for altruistic reasons. You go into a business, you invest, you sell your house, you do whatever to get that position, and you're expected to make a profit out of it. How can you get out of that? It is a business in Nigeria and nothing else. Thank you. I'm 
my name is Odia Costa. Um, I noticed there are not that many young people here. In many parts of the world, you've just described the diaspora, and children are doing very well indeed. We're very proud of them. But if they're not engaging in what's going on in Nigeria, for instance, I asked my son, I invited my son here today. He's an accountant, and he's got all sorts of financial training and all the rest of it. But he refused to come here, or rather, he failed to come here. He has other interests. And that's what um, I find disappointing. What would your, what, do you have any comments about that? Can I have one more question, uh, Shezin, before we go? Okay. We have one more question, and then sh uh, is it this uh, it's gentleman here. holding the mic? I have the mic. Yeah. So. You've got the <laughs> mic. <laughs> <laughs> I can determine which way it goes. Uh, um, I have a, a, a question. Um, first of all, congratulations, uh, Dr. Ganga. This is fantastic. When, um, and I want to ask about your term as uh, Minister of Trade and Investment. Um, specifically, you spoke, there were a couple of things that were important to you. One was the idea of creating an international finance center. And there were early talks I know you had about creating a monetary system that allowed for trade across Africa. How do you get trade in Africa to improve significantly? And I say that because intra-European trade is about 65, 70%. Intra-Africa trade is 17%. Maybe not quite exactly those same numbers, but something around those levels. How what was your vision about a number of things? One is around the International Open Center and how you think Africa can start to trade more among itself. Nigeria just came up with recently an experiment where we closed our borders and that created untold challenges for people. These tend to have political undertones. What is the message to politicians as to how to improve trade and reduce the friction across, because that's really essential to make sure that the continent grows, thank you. So I think we've got three questions there, um, Shegung. The first on development, uh, the second on politics and the status of Nigerian politicians, and the third on trade. Put, putting it very simply. And there was one about politicians there, about, um, did you talk about that? I said that. Uh, yeah. Now, now on, on, the, on the external factors, it, it's, I like to focus more, first of more, on what I can control. And that is what do I need to do, rather than think about what others might do or prevent me from doing. So I think the first thing is to get our own house in order and be the best that we can be. And I know we can be the best anywhere. When you have that, you can compete, you can deal with any external forces. See? Yeah. Terrorism? Yeah. I, won't, I, I would not have uh, considered that as an uh, external force because it's, it's insecurity which we have. And it doesn't just happen from outside, it happens you know, locally. So insecurity is one of the triple threats here. There's a chapter that deals with that. Uh, a chapter deals with poverty, unemployment, and insecurity. I call that the triple threat. Uh, here, so we, we, that is addressed here, uh, but there are reasons for that insecurity. It's a little bit complex, in the sense that where there is poverty and unemployment, you are likely to have a high level of insecurity. It's easier to recruit people and change their minds because of the level of poverty. So you can't just deal with security without dealing with the level of poverty and the high level of unemployment. That is what is here. And there are things we can do. And if you look at it, there was a study of a particular place in the country where I understand the state, it's like the government is not even present in that state. And the only business there is politics. So it's easier to recruit people from that state into those sorts of things. So I think it's not something you can deal with uh, in an isolated way. That's what I was trying to say here. And, and I did give some examples of what we can do uh, to, to, on, the, on that front. On the issue of uh, politics as a business, uh, that is covered in chapter one here. Um, we, we all know, you know, people see it as a profession, um, and it shouldn't be. Um, and the way to do it is to make it less attractive. 
if, if, if we do all the things we need to do, people go there because it appears that there's easy money to be made there. But if you block, there's a chapter here that talks about wastage, leakages, and all that. If you block all those, and you make it unattractive, and you pay them transparent uh, uh, fees and allowances and all that, not many people go into that sort of problem. We want to restructure it in a way that people who go into politics are people who really want to serve. You know, that's, uh, that's what we expected, that's what you want. It should be an honor, a privilege. It's like being called to be, uh, to represent your country in the Olympics, for example. It's a privilege, it's a big honor to do that. Um, and so it shouldn't be a money-making venture. Um, and, and as I said, that's covered in chapter one uh, of this book. You talked about your, your son. Um, I, the question, is he a Nigerian British person or British Nigerian? <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. Let me just clarify what I was going to say, or what I'm saying. We have a lot of children, Nigerians, in, di in the diaspora. Some of them were born in Nigeria and have moved over to the other various parts of the world. Some of them were born here, but still identify with Nigeria. But the thing is, what I find is a lot of them really don't want to engage with Nigeria, especially because they find it very difficult. There's nothing that the Nigerian <coughs> government, for instance, is doing to attract these children. As a matter of fact, I think it was sometime last year where one of the politicians, I think it was the senator in Nigeria, was saying, oh, they, they don't really care about people within the diaspora and they could do whatever they want. So that's, I would like you to address that point. Okay. Again, again, I think if you have a successful, strong nation, no matter where you are, you will still, the reality as a group, they find that no matter where you are, or no matter what you achieve, anywhere in the world, you will always, always be referenced back to Nigeria because of this, no matter how successful you are. When, when you realize that, you will know you have a stake. And you have a, as a group, they will understand that. I've been, I was a managing director of Gold. I was, I've been there. So um, what we need to do is fix the country. The diaspora group need to be the older ones. We, you need to organize yourself better. There's no reason why you cannot have a big influence on what is happening in Nigeria. The Irish American is part of the solution in Ireland. So why can't Nigerian, British, or American be part of the solution in Nigeria? Most of the old people that did things in Nigeria, you have, you see, you look at the industrial estate, all those things, the politics actually started here in the United Kingdom. Before they took it, so there's a lot you can do in the diaspora to influence what is happening back home. But if we all work together to build that nation that we know we can build, everyone will want to, will want to be part of it. We have to do our work first. On trade, we've always lamented about trade, and sometimes we say we, we don't believe those figures, that uh, data, we can't, re, you don't, you can't rely on data in Africa. We say all those things and all that. But reality is that intra-Africa trade is low compared to Asia, Europe, and all that. The first step is this African free trade zone, which we, we now have in place. Uh, that can work. Um, but we have to be able to produce what we need in Africa just like we need to be able to produce what we need and consume in Nigeria, which means that we have to encourage manufacturing value addition to all those things. So that is here, covered in the book, um, chapter, I think, five or so, where I talk about the economy. When we do that, then it will be easier to, to do that. Now, of course, logistics is important. I remember when we had the East Miss West event in Kia, uh, event, most of the businessmen there were complaining that the problem is that moving around Africa is actually very difficult. You know, getting visa, you have to get visas to go to different parts of uh, Africa, and it's hard to do it. 
I, I, also, even in ECOWAS, when we were having meetings in ECOWAS, I always had difficulty traveling to those meetings. We were billed a number of times using the presidential jets to go to meetings in Africa. Then Arix helped at a particular stage. So logistics, transportation, moving goods and people is important We invest in that infrastructure. And of course, you talked about internal channel financial center. It was the reason we gave one particular place in Nigeria a free trade zone. We gave them the free trade zone because we wanted to build that international financial center that will help and facilitate capital across uh, uh, Africa. Um, it's still there, the plan is there, but they have just not implemented it. Uh, we have a lot of plans, a lot of ideas. The idea is that we're, 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 we're long on, on, on plans, but very short on implementation. That's using the terminology of a hedge fund manager. Long in one and short in the others. And that's where uh, Shegun's excellent book uh, comes into its own, with practical solutions and a detailed analysis. Uh, another question? Gentleman at the back there. Good evening. Congratulations on a very nice book. I look forward to reading it from uh, page to page. One of the things you alluded to earlier is the cost of governance in Nigeria. We seem to have picked a system that is too expensive. And unfortunately, the people who have the power to change this benefit from it. How? can we change this? I think the cost of governance in Nigeria is just too expensive for the country at this point in time. Another question? This gentleman here in the red jumper? Yeah? Oh, sorry, the, this one. Um, yeah, so my questions are, um, the book, um, you said it's based on um, values and, and that's what um, we need. Um, Sorry? I'll, I'll repeat it. So most of the thoughts and ideas um, in the book, you said, are premised on values. Not necessarily, no. Okay. Yeah, have, you, have you read the book? No, I haven't. No, they're just based on what um, Nick said okay, at okay, the beginning. Right. Uh, when you read it, you'll find out. Ah, okay. So the question was a um, um, couple of things. Since most of um, our maybe existing leaders don't have um, a drive for values, is the book really for leaders in the future? <laughs> or is it really for <laughs> the leaders right now? Bearing in mind also that we don't seem to have a propensity to read a lot of books. So, I mean, our leaders. <laughs> so that, that, that's um, the first part. The second part is that you just talked about federal character. Again, is that a short-term thing that you think we need as a nation? Or do you think we can actually get away with it in the longer term because it should be based on merit? Thank you very much. Okay. We just to say one more, Shank, before. I think there's a gentleman here in the front. Yeah. Thank you. I grabbed the microphone because you were looking above my head. <laughs> my name is Kolapa Lawson, and I have two interlinked questions. Um, Lord Hastings, um, when he described that cartoon, he spoke of China, India, and Africa. Africa. China and India are countries. Africa Africa's is a Africa. continent of 54 countries, which begs the question of African integration, which I personally think is going to be essential for the prosperity of the African people. So I'd like to know the author's thoughts on this question of African um, integration. And secondly, which I think is a very important point, how do you deliver the political will for the implementation of all these wonderful um, advice that you have in the book? Because we can all be here knowing the, what needs to be done but the people who can change these things are the ones with the political power. How do you ensure that that political will for change is there? Thank you. Let, let me start from the, from the last question. I think we are 15, 10 minutes late now. 
we are overrunning. I'm watching there, Nick, you know what, yeah, yeah. yeah. we have 10 minutes. I don't know what you're looking at, Shane. Yes. <laughs> I think you're trying to escape. <laughs> I can stay here the whole day and keep talking, but I, I, I get my, my matching orders from there. Um, because we're going in for reception uh, after, after this uh, here. Anyway, three, three questions. Yes. Um, Integration of look, Africa. Yes. I, I, about political will, how do we get, make sure we get a change? I, I will hope that maybe the ambassador will answer that because he will, he, he represents, that's the president of Nigeria here. We're privileged to have the president of Nigeria. <laughs> so, the, the, the ambassador is always the president of where he is. He's representing the president, he says. So we have the president sitting here. So hopefully he would um, have heard and seen this. I remember when we started the Nigerian Leadership Initiative with TTA, Oba, and all of that. Dr. Kolade was part of that uh, event. And after the event, he wrote to President Obasanjo to tell him how important and how, what he took from that seminar and why the country needs to engage. It was on the basis of the letter that Dr. Kolade wrote to President Obasanjo that Obaso, President Obasanjo invited me to come with the Nigerian Leader Chief Initiative and Aspen Institute to Nigeria to run the seminar for him and his cabinet. And we came up with a number of suggestions on what the government needed to do going forward. So, um, so we, we should not underestimate, we should give that, that part of that job to the High Commissioner who is here. The, the, the second point also is that we're launching this book also in Nigeria on the 24th of July. And um, we intend to engage with most of the policymakers then, and of course, with the president and all that. So hopefully, but it's also a joint responsibility for all of us, everyone in this room. We, it's, it's, a, it's a country. We have a duty to do whatever we need to do to help move it forward. So I think uh, we can all play a role in that. In terms of Africa integration, I think the African leaders are beginning to see that unlike the European Union or the other countries, or even ECOWAS cannot enter any agreement or into any agreement on behalf of any of the member nations. Um, that's, they don't have the powers. I can give you an example when we wanted to sign an EPA, whatever it is. The, these organizations are, are set up, but they're can not given the that power. Is, uh, ECOWAS. EPA, e what is EPA? EPA, Economic Par Partnership Agreement. That was the partnership agreement which Europe wanted to have with South Africa. Um, I won't go into details about that. I think I wrote about it. But the point I'm making is that the AU also doesn't have enough powers. But what I hear the president saying now is that they now feel insulted when China is having an event and is inviting the whole of the, the African presidents to come to China to come and have meetings. I say, that's one, co one country inviting a whole continent. And I heard the president of Kenya argue that they are now trying to make plans to give, give more powers to AU. And I think if they do that, that will be part of the, the beginning of that integration. I think there's, it's some time to go, but I think uh, you can see the beginnings of that um, based on what, what they're doing uh, for now. In terms of, uh, I think the, the, there was a question about federal character. Federal character, when you look at it from the other side, is, well, why do we have it? But actually, it's meant for inclusiveness. When you have a country that is as diverse as Nigeria, you need to have a mechanism in place to make sure that everyone feels in, in, involved. Yeah, there needs to be equity, fairness, and all that. The argument which I make and which others have made is that Regardless of it, there are good people everywhere in the country. You just need to saturate, whether it's Gombe or, or, or Taraba or whatever it is, there are competent people from there. The problem is that we don't go for the competent people anywhere. So the, the emphasis should be having prescription in terms of the, the qualities, the experience, the qualifications you need for a particular job and making sure that someone from that state who meets those requirements is employed. There's quality everywhere in the country. 
and the, 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 the federal culture was meant for inclusiveness. Uh, so there's a reason for that. Um, I think the other point you made is about values. You said maybe it's for future generation. It seems that you've written off everybody here to start with. <laughs> And if that's the case, I, I think it's a little bit unfair, huh? because that's not the case. But if you go back, in the times of my father, grandfather, the communities, they, we had a very, very strong value system in the country. And if you look at the different cultures in different parts of the country, if you come from the western part of the world, you hear the word omoluabi. You see, omo ti olu iwa iwa. B. That, that is, that's something for someone who has integrity, good character. And you have the same thing in the north and in the, and in the, in the east. Our communities all along were built on strong cultures. We, 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 were grew, we, we, we were brought up in communities where if they couldn't identify your source of income, you are ostracized from that community. We, we, they grew up in societies where everybody looked after the other person's children. We once had it. The problem is that maybe anyone who is 45 years and below may not have experienced that. But we did have it. And that's why it's going to be a lot easier for us to do it going forward. Um, I, think, I think that's... Uh, there was one other question. Too. No, no, no. I think they want to. That's it. I mean, Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, very um, engaging questions and, and some really insightful answers. Um, before we head out for drinks and food and the networking, um, we've got with us the Nigeria High Commissioner to the UK, um, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Sa Sarafa Tunji Ishola who's going to join us. He's going to join us shortly for some closing remarks. And after we've had his um, closing remarks, we're going to move on to the cloister halls where we're going to, um, we'll show you the way and we'll carry on from there. Welcome, sir. Uh, Dr. Aganga, the man of the moment. <laughs> I really salute you. I've been here for two years, but I've, I've not had the opportunity to meet this kind of cross-section of Nigerians in the UK. So thank you for the opportunity that you have given to me on this occasion. And I take this opportunity to thank you immensely for putting your thoughts together. And I also strongly believe that the journey to 1,000 kilometers Yes, it will always start with a step. You are the vision. This vision, we all have to drive. Um, I had the opportunity of talking to the all-party parliamentary group on Nigeria, sometimes in November. I was very clear in my mind what I told them. I'm going to repeat here now. Our challenges in Nigeria and the greatest, greatest threat to our dear country are misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Misinformation can be classified as false or inaccurate information, especially that which is deliberately intended to deceive. Whereas this information is information deliberately created to harm, mislead, or manipulate a person or a country. And malinformation is information based on a fact but used out of context to mislead, harm, or manipulate citizens of a country. And that is what we see all over the place. If you take any of Nigerian uh, newspaper today, any day, what you see are fr uh, front uh, pages of those newspapers are negatives. And, uh, you have a situation whereby even here in Britain, Nigerians are celebrated on so many fronts. I was at Bolton University yesterday, and I felt proud being a Nigerian. The best graduating student is from Nigeria. The president of the student union is also a Nigerian. 
and he, he delivered a five-minute speech and moved the whole hall. That is who we are. So we need to work on this. Indians, Chinese, and the rest of them make use of this so-called WhatsApp to network, to bond, to do business, and build their country. But in our own case, the WhatsApp is used <laughs> to destroy. You know, it's not a laughing matter. It's a serious matter. So when you, because we live in a world where there's competition. For example, investable funds will always go to where there's security. So it, all you just, if you are competing with Nigeria, all you just need to do is just bring the newspapers, put them together, put the social media comments, put them together. So we are the one destroying our country. And often I hear people talk about leaders. That's another paradox. Nigeria is a country where all the blames go to the leaders and the led are innocent. <laughs> How can that be possible? So it's time we start looking at the whole system instead of really blaming the leaders all the time. I told them at Bolton University that so sometimes I feel like crying. Why? Because from independence today, we have always destroyed all our leaders without exception. Tafaba Lewa was the prime minister. What did we do to him? We took him to a bush and killed him, only for his body to be discovered three days after. We brought Unrosi. He went to Ibadan. We assassinated him. Then after him came Gowan. My years went to OEU. He was banished from coming back to Nigeria. Then came Muritala. Muritala came. We killed him. Then after Obasanjo, three years, he left. Uh, Shagari came. He was overthrown, put in a dungeon, lost his eyesight for serving Nigeria. And after, we have uh, Buhari. He was also overthrown, isolated, humiliated. Then we had Babangida, who was also humiliated out of power. Then came uh, Shunekon, of course. Same thing. Then uh, the, what we, uh, Abaka came. He even wanted to spend three months, according to him, but he spent nine months, so it was no issue. Then after him came Obasanjo. Upon what Obasanjo did to reform, which you know, on a kind of thought time, he was also humiliated out of power. Of course, then came Yaradu. I didn't send, spend much time. He died. Then came Jonathan. You, you know very well the kind of humiliation Jonathan suffered. We did the same with Buari. We have started with Tinumbuna. And which country would develop with that kind of tra trajectory? We have to do a lot of soul searching. Where are we getting it wrong? Every time we keep on blaming the leaders, our leaders are not good as if they come from heaven. So it is time that we all get involved. The diaspora community, I must say, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the early 50s, provided the kind of leadership that our country should have. It started from here, Then Papaolo went back home and recruited the principals, largely principals of schools across the Western region. Those were the people that are responsible for his government. People talk of free education. It was Adekun Ajasi that wrote the proposal. But Aulo, as the premier, implemented it. We had the first television station in, Af in Africa, even before France, and so many other things. So the diaspora community that we have remit about $20 billion on average every year. But wait a minute. Whereas the diaspora population in India, in China, and the rest of them, use their own remittance towards production. 70% of our own remittance is for consumption. I'm going to do the wedding of my son, or, or I'm going to, yeah, cons con consumption. So you can imagine if there's a deliberate, even if it's block making industry, if it's farming and the rest of it, imagine 70% of that re remittance going into production. Because what we have as the biggest problem in our country, two major things, poverty and illiteracy. Because you talk of election, 
Democracy is always difficult to practice where you have poverty and literacy. One, somebody who has not had a meal for two, two days, for example, and say, okay, take 1,000 to vote for me. But it's, it's, fa it's faculty of reasoning. The reasoning faculty cannot be straight. So we now have an opportunity. People ask of the way forward. The way forward must start from here. And how do we do that? We keep on dissecting this problem. But we now need to go to the next level of saying, how do we make a difference? How do we, how do we make a difference? I'm happy for one thing. In Nigeria today, there is no community that does not have a diaspora person outside Nigeria. And the diaspora community will affect the change because what we have as problems in Nigeria cannot, you know, you can't say it exists in diaspora. There's no poverty in diaspora. The diaspora is educated. So within that context, we can say, yes, this change must be effected because we want the change. Um, we had uh, our elections. I, I was being asked several questions about the election. And my answer is very simple. We, ha we had our elections. This election is not perfect. And I always tell the British public here, please tell me which country has perfect elections. But each country manage their imperfections. We have, election itself is, is part of a process. It's not an end. And I said, well, our election is not perfect, but it's part of a process. Process in electing leaders, which you always start from delimitation of constituency to registration of voters to uh, primaries, I mean, producing candidates, election, and education of dispute, if any, in the courts. So after the court process, whatever the court pronounced, we move on with our country. But I, I can assure you that the, after the courts have uh, you know, come out with various uh, judgments, we will still have people protesting. Which country develops around that? We talk of the rule of law. Whether our, we want to say the judge is, uh, I mean, the, the judge is corrupt or whatever thing that is put there, you, we have to follow and, and move on. So the next thing now will not be, how do we develop this country? Yes, we'll criticize our leaders, but we don't destroy them. Because at the end of the day, the more we destroy this leader, the more we always come back. Who is talking about Buhari today? This time last year, it was a different thing. So why should it be so? Yeah, uh, Mr. Buhari, these things you are doing well. These things you are not doing well. We also feel that it should be done this way. That's a con constructive criticism. I'm putting the leaders on the toe. So the, 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 the paradigm has to change. We must appreciate that. We, and uh, we must appreciate the fact that all of us are part of the problem. Once we admit that, then we can start doing self-soul searching to be able to go to where we need to go. And finally, the charge is going to go to you, sir. For you to mobilize this kind of people here, I believe that the change can start from here now. I am ready. I am ready. We have seven MPs in the House of Commons. Do they bond? Do they network? The answer is no. We have British councillors, British Nigerian councillor here, who can pass 